In Jesus Christ, all of us are called. And we are called to follow Him, love Him, and serve Him. We are talking about uh, the generation after the millennials, also known as iGen, as I will be referring to it. There are people who are born from 1995 to 2012. And iGen is unique, but Jesus is for every generation. And that's something I want to continue to emphasize throughout this sermon series, that no matter where you are, when you were born, Jesus is for you and you are called to to love Him, respond to Him, and know Him as Lord and Savior. So there's different generations, and uh, I got a little grief from from some people saying that uh, I only stopped going back at the, the boomers. So I added a new generation on the screen here. Let's, uh, there you go. There's the, the silent generation is what the, the people called the born before 1946. And uh, apparently I did some looking around and they're called the silent generation because they were not people who were ones to rock the boat. They grew up during the Great Depression and World War II, and so they tend to focus on what's needed and what's necessary, and they're kind of focused on survival. And so they're not, you know, activistic sort of a group. But apparently they were called the Silence back in 1951, and it kind of just stuck. So if you were born before 46, then you would fall into this category. The rest of the categories here, are we, there we go. Those are, those are up for, for your information. Each generation has been shaped by different events that happened as they were growing up. And uh, the most recent generation has been shaped by the internet and by cell phones, smartphones especially. So I in iGen stands for internet, individualism, insecure, irreligious, insulated, and today, inclusive. There's a lot of distinctives of this generation, and not all of the sweeping generalizations that I'm going to make apply to everyone in this generation. I want to throw that out there. But there are more trends among this group of people compared to others going back. Let's look at Matthew 22, 1 through 14. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So I want to call a couple couple things to your attention here. I've preached on this passage before, so I'm not going to do an exhaustive overview of it. But I want to mention a few things here. In verses 5 and 6 there, it says, They paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. So these honored guests, honored maybe in quotes, were not only rude, but they committed high treason. This is a king who is throwing a wedding feast for his son. And when you 
not only treat the king's attendants or, or uh, representatives shamefully, but to even kill them, that's, that's high treason against the country. It's to insult and kill the king's messengers, you're treating them as if they were trespassing on your property. And this is the king's land. This is the king's country. You can't do that. So I just wanted to mention that. So these honored guests, they were, they were not worthy of, of coming, obviously, because of how they acted. So then the king says, all right, we, we need guests at the wedding here. So go out into the streets and just invite anybody you find. If you see somebody, invite them in. We, we need a wedding hall that's filled with guests. Doesn't matter who they are, just invite them. Whoever passes by, invite them in. So invite as many as you find. And then when they gathered a bunch of people in, you notice in verse 10 that it says, those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. The wedding guests were both good and bad, or bad and good. Notice how it says, listed bad first even. That, that's an interesting choice of words there because bad there, that doesn't mean that they were bad looking or bad smelling or anything like that, although they might have been that. That word bad there actually has some sinful connotations to it. These, these were bad people. They had done some terrible things. These were people that you might not want to hang out with very much. These, just, these are just bad guys, bad people. So both bad and good were gathered in there. Just a quick mention there that this is kind of a picture of the church. We're supposed to gather people in, good and bad, whatever kind of people that they are, so that the wedding of the Christ and the church is filled with guests. So this call of the gospel goes out to everybody, good and bad doesn't matter who they are. So, I wanted to mention those things. Now, <clears throat> iGen. From sexuality to gender and race, iGen is thoroughly inclusive. This is a generation that is, has that as a priority. We want to include everyone. So it's a philosophy of tolerance that, that they have as a rule again. Live and let live. And according to the book that I read, iGen teens have experienced a record-setting amount of diversity in their schools, neighborhoods, and activities. Most 12th graders said their high school was at least half of another race, which is double from what it was in 1980, and three times more since 1980 said their close friends were of other races. So, Racially, we're much more diverse. Um, opposition to a close relative marrying a black person is hitting new lows, as is thinking blacks are unintelligent. Uh, support for legal same-sex marriage increases with youth. The lower or the younger the generation, the more likely they are to say, "Yeah, I, I support uh, legal same-sex marriage." Uh, there was even a comment about. Even believing uh, Christian of this generation, that I think I put that comment up there. The author said, young people often struggle to reconcile their iGen upbringing with their religion's viewpoint that homosexuality is wrong. And they even had an interview where this, this young person was kind of talking out of both sides of her mouth, trying to trying to represent both of these ideals of being inclusive and, uh, and the beliefs of Christianity. So, this generation here is, is thoroughly inclusive, and it's an inclusive generation. Now, I just want to mention this here, that when it comes to Jesus, absolutely everyone is welcome. This call of the gospel goes out to anyone and everyone. It doesn't matter who they are, what they've done, where they come from, what language they speak. This call of the gospel goes out to everyone, all people. It says in verse 9, Invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. 
In other words, if you run into somebody, invite them. It's the, king command, the king's command to the servants there. And it says, they gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So not only the good, but also the bad. These people are invited. Come to the Savior now, as the song that we just sang said. And there's plenty of Bible verses that support this. One, one that's pretty familiar is John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him, whoever, should not perish but have eternal life. And then Romans 10, 11 through 13. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Even in the Old Testament, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. As Gary read uh, the call to worship. So, this is, this is a call that goes out to everybody. And that should not be underestimated. Anyone was invited to that wedding feast. And anyone to this day is invited to know Jesus Christ. And then, in our passage here, it kind of shifts gears a little bit after the wedding hall is filled with guests. Maybe you noticed that. In verses 11 through 14, it kind of kind of shifts a little bit. There's this guy who's not wearing wedding clothes. And it kind of takes a different tone. But I want to say a couple of things about this. Both then and now, everybody knows that you dress up for weddings. It's just kind of a, it's just kind of a thing. You don't wear your worst clothes to a wedding. Somebody invites you to a wedding, you dress respectably at least. If not a black tie sort of an affair, depending on, depending on who's inviting you, I suppose. But everybody dresses up for weddings. Now, if you are invited to the king's son's wedding, then you would be especially concerned to dress up all the more. Because it's, it's the king, and this is, how, this is how kings dress, right? But then there's this, this situation where they're just inviting anybody off the streets. And that's all kinds of people, right? People who maybe only have one set of clothing. So inviting anyone means beggars, which would require the host to have proper clothing provided. If he expected, if he expected everybody to dress appropriately, then that would, that would be implied there. So there's only one person here who's not wearing wedding clothes, and only one out of quite likely quite a few beggars, if you're inviting people off the streets at that time, you're probably going to get quite a few beggars. And if there's only one who's not wearing wedding clothes, you can be sure that wedding clothes were provided. And the, guy, the, the king calls to this guy and he says, he calls him friend. So it's not like he's, it's not like this guy is, He's looking to get rid of him. He, he calls him a friend at first there. The fact that this guy was speechless says, basically, I have nothing to say to you. He's basically saying to this king, I got nothing to say to you. It's not that, it's not that he didn't have clothing to wear. If this man was a poor beggar and didn't have access to wedding clothes, he wouldn't have been speechless. He would have said something like, Your Majesty, I'm, I'm very sorry. I, I didn't, this was the best that I had to, to wear here. If there's anything else that you have to wear, I'd be happy to put that on. You know, if, if he really did care, then that would have been his response. Speechless? No. So this guest essentially thought his own clothes were good enough. He, he, thought that, he thought that what he was wearing was fine. I don't need to dress up for your wedding. It's blatant and intentional disrespect. And especially back then, when you're in an honor-shame culture, 
to give honor to the king is, is very important. It shows that you acknowledge this person as your king. To show disrespect and dishonor to the king is basically to say this person is not my king. I don't care what he thinks. I don't care about him at all. Then there's verse 14. For many are called, but few are chosen. The gist of this here is that an invitation is not an entitlement. We are invited, but that doesn't mean that we are entitled. An invitation is not a license to do whatever you want. And that's true to this day in the weddings that we have. Weddings are special events with expectations of guests. When you go to a wedding, there's some expectations for how you're going to conduct yourself. So, your bride and groom at any given wedding, they, they want things to go a certain way. They want it to go well. The ceremony is scripted, and there's even a rehearsal to make sure that everybody knows how they're supposed to how they're supposed to stand and where they're supposed to go at what times. Wedding is a big deal. And if you're going to attend the wedding, there's some expectations about how you're going to conduct yourself as well. So if they're at the wedding, even to this day, and anybody causing trouble at this wedding can expect to be kicked out. If there's... If you're, if you're a bride, for example, and your ex-boyfriend shows up ready to crash this wedding and stand up and profess his undying love for you, you're going to make sure that that guy is out of here because that is just going to cause all kinds of trouble. You don't want that to happen. So, that's kind of the context of what's going out. In case you thought that the king was maybe a little harsh with this guy, it's, it's not maybe how it might appear. iGen is inclusive, but also sees morality as an individual preference. So it's a little more than just being inclusive. It's kind of, there's this general sense that right and wrong is just sort of a personal preference. Just kind of, kind of what, whatever's up to you. Individual choice is a big deal generally speaking, in this generation. So this inclusivity is not based on recognizing God's image in everybody as much as it is a laissez-faire attitude to life, kind of live how you want, just don't harm anybody. So for example, more in this generation think pot is safe and think pot should be legal. More think abortion should be legal and available for any reason. The average I Jenner is less likely to support nationalized health care because, again, individual choice is very important. And the average I Jenner is less likely to agree that government should have more environmental regulations, even, because, again, it takes choices away. I Jenners are just less willing to label anything as wrong. It's all up to the individual. That's a direct quote from the book. For example, in this generation, approval, moral approval of premarital sex is at new highs. It was relatively steady from the 1970s to 2006, kind of around 50%, and now it's at 70% of seniors leaving high school. And yet, iGeners are less likely to have premarital sex. They're saying it's okay, but they're not doing it. They're less likely to. And approval of sex before age 16 is hitting new heights. It's five times what it was in 2016 than in 1986. But people are losing their virginity later now than before. So what's really going on here is that people just don't want to label things wrong. They don't want to say something is wrong.
But there is a wrong way to be a wedding guest, and there is a wrong way to live in God's world. The wedding clothes here in this parable, they represent the righteousness of Christ that we are told to put on in verses such as Romans 13, 14. And that's given by God, and we have to put it on. We're given the righteousness of Christ, because on our own, we are not righteous enough to stand in God's presence. We have to have Christ's righteousness. Romans 13, 14, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. When you come to acknowledge the Lord Jesus, you call him Lord, you do what he says. He's your Lord. He's your master. This defiant guest here in the, in the parable may have been a well-to-do person who thought his clothes were fine. Or he may have been a beggar who thought his clothes were fine. But either way, he's basically saying, I'm good enough on my own. I don't need your clothes. We can't say that to God. I'm good enough for you, God. Because all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Putting on your own righteousness, thinking we're good enough for God on our own merits, and or refusing our change to change our life to be like Christ is equally putting ourselves in place of God. Generally, I, Jen, is indifferent to reality and simply values individual choice. Again, generally. But this is the trend right now. And the author of this book says, more young people now associate religion with rigidity and intolerance and automatic anathema to a highly individualistic and accepting generation. So the turnoff of this next generation to religion is that we label things as wrong. And we would limit individual choices. There's a quote from one person that was interviewed in this book by Brittany, who's 19, who says, I don't pray, nor do I believe in an omniscient God. I like to think that your whole life isn't planned out already for you and that your choices determine who you become. In other words, I can't believe in an omniscient God because... I want to believe in my choices. What's really up with this generation, again, according to according to the majorities and trends and stuff, money is in, meaning is out. For example, going to college is no longer for discovering what's real or developing beliefs for life. It's about getting a high paying job. More and more students entering college are saying, I'm here to make lots of money when I get out. Fewer and fewer are saying, I'm here to develop a meaningful philosophy of life. In the mid-60s, about 90% of those entering college were looking for a meaningful philosophy of life. And only 40% were looking for a very, being very well off financially. You were asked to check a bunch of different things that you were looking for out of college. 40% checked very well off financially is why they were there. 90% checked meaningful philosophy of life. Today, it's reversed. More money means more choices on where you can live and what you can own and how you can spend your time. If you have more money, there are more options available to you. Individual choices. But a little bit of a reality check. When choices ignore reality, reality has a way of putting you in your place and biting you in the butt. When you ignore reality, it catches up with you. So, for example, Hitler thinking that he knew more than his generals when he was invading Russia, Or the Titanic, thinking that they were unsinkable and so they were just going to fly through this iceberg-laden ocean because nothing was going to happen. Or even if you want to talk about the 2016 presidential election, when you ignore reality, it catches up with you. Look at the screen here. 
Let's answer this. Why is the Son of God called Jesus, meaning Savior? Because He saves us from our sins. Salvation cannot be found in anyone else. It is futile to look for any salvation elsewhere. The reality is that Jesus is the only salvation. There's not a bunch of options for salvation out there. There's just one. There's just one. And whether you like it or not, that's reality. John 14, verse 6. The same Bible that says that Jesus is open to everyone also says that salvation is very exclusive. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's it. Nobody else. And Isaiah 43, 11, I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. There's one God who saves. And 1 John 5, 10 through 12, whoever believes in the Son of God has this testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. If you don't have the Son of God, you're dead. And that's that's just the reality of it. You might have a beating heart and brain waves, but spiritually, you're dead. You're lifeless. Jesus gives an inclusive welcome, but his salvation is exclusive. It's exclusive. God's kingdom is like a wedding, so our choices must honor the host. That's the reality of living our life. There is a king, and our choices need to honor the host. And when we dishonor the host, just like we we would dishonor the host at any wedding, we'll be kicked out. This is how it works. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, our God in heaven, as much as we would value individual choice, we pray, Lord, that we would value you most of all, that we would recognize the reality that you've laid out in your word, that we would be open to inviting anyone to your wedding banquet, but that, Lord, we would recognize our duty to honor the host of this wedding and, Lord, the host of this life that we all live. In Jesus' name, amen.